Welcome back, Beaver Nation, to another edition of the Beaver Sports Show. Joining me once again is Alex Crawford, and filling in for Johnny Motomochi to his left is Kazra Azizian. Guys, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing super good. Really excited to work with you, Kaz, although you do like a Middle Eastern doctor tonight, but I mean, <laughs> respect. Well, thank you. Thank you, Boone, for having me once more. And Crawford, I intend on disagreeing with every single point that you make tonight. So Bring it on, Here baby. Here we go. Here we go. Coming up, we're going to have Beaver baseball and softball updates for all of you guys. And coming up, Alex will certainly have his hands full in our newest segment, the Beaver Roundtable, as Alex and Kaz will debate the questions that I want answered. You're watching the Beaver Sports Show on KBVR-TV. Stay tuned. From the KBVR TV studio on the campus of Oregon State University, this is the Beaver Sports Show. Welcome back to the Beaver Sports Show. The Beaver baseball team traveled to Salt Lake City, Utah this past weekend to take on the Utah Utes in an important Pac-12 matchup. After splitting the first two games over the Utes, the Beavers faced a must-win game on Sunday as they are fight fighting for the best possible seed come the postseason. With more on Sunday's game, here is Sports Show reporter Mackie Swan. Dan Child led the Beavs to a 5-4 win Sunday at Spring Mobile Ballpark in Salt Lake City. Child struck out 11 Utah batters, making him the first Beaver pitcher to reach double-figure strikeouts in a game this season. Michael Conforto had three hits, including a home run. Conforto is tied for the Pac-12 conference lead with 11 home runs. For the series, Conforto led the Beavers with seven hits and three home runs. In the 10th inning, Nate Esposito walked with the bases loaded, giving the 23rd-ranked Beavers the series win. On Tuesday, the Beavers hosted the Portland Pilots at Goss Stadium and won 12-4. The win pushed the Beavers' record to 33-17 overall and 13-11 in conference play. The Beavers will travel to Pullman, Washington this weekend to face the Washington State Cougars, and with two conference series left, Pat Casey's team is looking to head into the postseason with great momentum. Thanks, Mackie. The softball team is back in the postseason as it was announced that the Beavers will travel to Norman, Oklahoma to participate in the NCAA Regional hosted by the University of Oklahoma. The Beavers will open against the Tulsa Golden Hurricanes on Friday at 3 p.m. and depending on the result will play either Oklahoma or Lehigh on Saturday in the double elimination format. Fans will be able to follow the action of the games by live webcast on Soonersports.com or by following the Oregon State softball team on Twitter at Oregon State SB. The Oregon State men's golf team will compete in the 2012 NCAA Division I Golf Championship at the Stanford Regional today through Saturday. Oregon State enters the regional having placed fifth in the inaugural Pac-12 Conference Championships, and the Beavers also have two team titles on the season. The Beavers regional lineup consists of Nick Chinello, David Fink, our own Johnny Motomochi, Matt Rawitzer, and Nick Sherwood. If the Beavers finish in the top five this week, they will advance to the NCAA Championships from May 29th through June 3rd. The Oregon State track and field team closed out the Pac-12 Championships on Sunday at Hayward Field at the University of Oregon. Laura Carlisle competed in the 1500 meter finals. Carlisle ran in one of the most competitive fields of the weekend as she finished in sixth place with a time of 4 minutes and 20.96 seconds, which was her second fastest time of the season. Marcus Wheaton, Brandon Cooks, Malcolm Marable, and Keenan Parker competed in the 4 by 100 meter relay finals and finished in eighth place with a time of 41.71 seconds. If it hadn't been for a few rough handoffs, they very well could have finished as high as sixth, according to head coach Kelly Sullivan. The Oregon State track and field team will be back in action on May 24th as a select group of athletes that have qualified for regionals will travel to Austin, Texas to compete at the NCAA West Track and Field Re Regional. We are going to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, Alex and Kaz will debate the questions that I want answered in our newest segment, the Beaver Roundtable. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Beaver Sports Show, and it's time for our newest segment, the Beaver Roundtable. And guys, to start things off, it was announced on Wednesday that the men's basketball team will embark on a European trip from August 18th through the 28th, and will play a couple exhibition games against European squads. How do you think this will help the team as they prepare for the upcoming season? Well, I'll, take, I'll take this one, Boone. This is great for the Beavers. This gives them 10 days of extra practice and extra competition against some pretty good quality competition as well. But what it also does, it gives the young guys a chance to play. The Beavers have six guys on their roster that, are, that haven't played yet, and it will give them an opportunity to shine. Obviously, we're waiting on uh, Langston Morris Walker to come in. My, one of my favorites, Daniel Gomez, will finally get a chance to play. And then they got uh, Robbins coming straight out of Compton. They just picked him up recently. So it will give the chance for the Beavers to get some new guys on the court. But most importantly, I think in basketball is, is teamwork and playing together and creating that chemistry. I mean, skills aside, as if you know where everybody else is going to be, if you know where what tendencies players t tend to have, then uh, that's valuable on the basketball court. So this is only good news for the Beavers, and I'm sure it's going to be a great experience for the whole team to be over in Europe playing. So. As much as I wish I could disagree with Kaz, I have to agree with him. I think this Europe trip is going to be great. I mean, like Kaz said, there's a lot of guys coming in that don't have much experience playing together. And I know on a national scale, a lot of people are looking at Oregon State and saying, hey, Oregon State lost Jared Cunningham. They're going to suffer. They're going to be in a hole. I personally don't think they are with the new guys we got coming in, like right. Jamal Reed, Langston Morris Walker, Victor Robbins, all those guys. Gonna going to make a huge impact right off the bat. Also, guys like Daniel Gomez, and let's not forget, Roberto Nelson's probably going to be thrust into that starting role at shooting guard. Uh, he's not really used to starting at that role, so for him to get experience against good competition is going to be huge. I think this is a great move by Oregon State to go play in Europe, and I honestly don't think Oregon State is going to be hurting missing Jared Cunningham. Honestly, I think it could be the best thing that happened to the team this season. It'll make so. guys step up for sure because they no longer have Jared Cunningham right. to rely this, on. This is the post-Jared Cunningham team, and we're going we're gonna to see if, uh, if Roberto Nelson is going to step up, if it's going to be a mod Starks. So when it comes down to crunch time, this, these few games are going to help the Beavers figure out who that guy is going to be the go-to down the stretch. And Daniel Gomez, I'll tell you what, that guy's in some of my classes. He is huge. Big dude. Big dude. And so I'm excited to see what he can do out on the court. And... Uh, it's looking up for the Beavers. Honestly. I think Daniel Gomez is going to be an impact player next year, honestly. Okay. I really think he is. Don't sleep on him. He certainly is going to help the Beavers shore up defensively. But the one thing, though, the, they need someone to step up that can be that go-to guy when the offense goes stagnant. Because so many times last year, the, they, they led the conference in scoring, but so many times they slowed down on offense and it became Jared just dribbling around yep. and creating his own shot. So. You need that on the basketball court, though. You need a guy that, when things aren't going well, that can make his own shot. So it'll be interesting to find out who can do, do it, if it's one of the new guys or if it's a mod star, because I personally think it'd be a mod, though, mm -hmm. at this point. I have a lot of faith in Birdo, though. I yeah. have a lot of faith in Birdo. When he came to this program, he was a program-changing recruit, so I think he could step up, honestly, and fill that role. Definitely. I definitely agree with you. And just it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for the guys, a trip to Europe to play yeah, basketball. I mean, you can't beat that at all. Be, it's going to be some good team bonding. For sure. <laughs> Definitely. So the next question for you guys, following the baseball team's weekend against Utah, they got the series win, but some more problems with the relief pitching in the bullpen. Could, could not hold a lead. On Sunday, Dan Child pitched the entire game going 10 innings. Pat Casey didn't even put a guy in there to lose the lead for him. How big of a problem is this for the, this team as they only have two series left in the regular season before they go to the postseason? Alex? Well, let me tell you, it's a, it's a huge problem. Do I know what to do to fix it? No, but I mean, if you look at any, I'm going to compare them to a Major League Baseball team. If you look at any team that's won the World Series recently, a huge strength has been the bullpen. The Giants in 2010, the Cardinals in 2011, both teams had great bullpens, team, uh, bullpens that won games for them, and you cannot make it to the postseason or do well in the postseason without a good bullpen. So is it a big problem? Yes. Do I know what to do? I have no idea. Dang it, I'm trying to find a way to disagree with you as well. <laughs> but, I mean, this is just a relief pitcher, I think, is one of the toughest positions in baseball. Your job description includes you're coming out there, usually in pressure situations, just right into the middle of the game after everybody's been playing for a couple hours, and you're expected to pitch strikes and get strikeouts and get people out. It's a tough job. But if the Beavers want to have any chance of getting anywhere in the postseason, we got to figure it out. And the, the, game, the series against Utah, that should have been 
a clean sweep. We shouldn't have any problems. All three games were close, two of them going into extra innings. We can't be having that. And you can't, when it comes time for tournament time, you can't be having your pitchers pitch nine, ten innings every yeah. night. They need to be getting their rest, getting ready to pitch the next games. So I don't know what they got to do, but the, the relief pitchers need to step up. And at period. this point in the season, what can Pat Casey really do? It's so late in the season. It's it's almost impossible to be like, all right, you have to step up and you have to be the new guy. At this point in the season, the roles are already defined. Right. And we saw this last year in the regionals when Sam Gaviglio pitched a masterful game in his first regional start. And then they went to super regionals and he had nothing left in the tank and yeah. got lit up by Virginia. So this is going to be a, a balancing act, I think, for Pat Casey as he has to figure out what guys to play and can a certain guy go 10 innings like a Dan Child late in the season. But this is definitely a cause for concern, and this might be the reason why the Beavers don't go to the Super Regional or right. get out of a Regional. Or, oh, I was going to say, definitely, I mean, championship teams have good bullpens, whether it's a closer or just a middle reliever, a guy that comes in and pitches one-third of an inning. They're solid in those roles, so... I think the one thing that could happen is that obviously the offense just step it up. I mean, I mean it's it's tough to say, but the offense if they can keep rattling the bats and get themselves comfortable leads and not putting the relief pitchers in situations where they can lose the game, that's about the best option yeah. I, we got the, right now. The offense is scoring runs. They are leaving some guys left on base, but right. that's going to happen when you're hitting the ball so well. Right. But it's it's really going to come down to the pitching, though. Yeah. So last question: the USA Today published its annual report about college revenue and what the Division I programs uh, bring in. And of course, in the Oregon State, compared to the <laughs> University of Oregon, OSU only brought, had its revenue increased 3.6% in the last five years, while Oregon had an astounding 89.9% revenue increase. So guys, I know at Oregon State, money is pretty tight, but with the new Pac-12 network coming in, all programs are supposed to get 20, at least $20 million a year. If you guys were the athletic director, if you guys were Bob DeCareless, how would you go about increasing revenue, and do you have any ideas about what you would do? Uh, the most basic thing that it comes down to is winning games. Yes. It sucks to say yes. it's winning games. The winning games will put some butts in the stands, and that's what the Beavers need right now, especially for football. Football is our main powerhouse, our main breadwinner, and uh, hopefully this season we'll, we'll turn it around a little bit and get some people in the stand. I think Bob's doing a great job with what he can do, um, but I mean, we, hopefully we can have a better football season and get some, get some season tickets up, get that size of the stadium filled and getting, getting the stadium mm -hmm. to look what it used to look like. Yeah, no, I do agree. I mean, the reason that Oregon's revenue went up 89.9% is not because of their world-class track program. It's not because their baseball program's been doing well. It's because of their football program, plain and simple. I mean, they pack Austin Stadium day in and day out, and people are willing to shell out top-notch prices for those tickets, and then their, their program makes money. They get more good players coming in. It's, you know, it's a cycle. The better football program does, the more money you make, the more good players you get, the more kids want to come to your school, et cetera. Oregon State needs to do that as well. I don't know what you know. I don't Oregon know what it's going to take. Oregon does have the benefit of having one of the best boosters yes. that you could ever get yes. until yes. night with the University of Nike. But I mean, other than winning games, I think what the Beavers could do is they can market better. Oh yeah, marketing hasn't been that great for OSU. A lot yeah. of people don't know what's going on. Then when they think of Oregon and college football, they only think of the Ducks. And that I mean, who's to blame them? The Ducks have gone to three straight BCS games, have won you know, back to back to back Pac-10 championships. So it really does come down to winning football games, but I think it's a collaborative effort. You know, you also have to support the football program to bring in better recruits, to market better, you know, switch up the jerseys a little right. bit, do some logo, logo, in cha logo changes. But I mean, the high school kids that you're recruiting to, they definitely like that stuff. So you oh, kind of yeah. have to oh, meet yeah. them halfway. Facilities, jerseys, looking good, playing good. Those things are all things that uh, attract 18 year old kid who's being like, Look at this shiny uniform. Mm -hmm. Look at this nice locker that I'm going to have. So maybe it's re-upping re, re our facilities, getting the kind of things that U of O has. Man, they got massage, massage therapists yeah. for individual pe players out there. It, it's a, it's a freaking the Weston art. It's, in there. Oh, yeah. It's like it's that a, it's playing for an hotel. NFL team. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so. U of O is top-notch when it comes to facilities. If you go over there and look at them, can we compete with that? Not on the same no. level, but we can make steps in the right direction. I think what OSU needs to do is kind of embody more of that old school spirit. Because U of O, I mean, you look at their jerseys, their facilities, like, we're cutting edge, we're modern. Let's, let's be lunch pale U. Let's be old school. 
I mean, we all saw what the, the Civil War unis looked like, the Nike Pro Combats two years ago, that old school style. Let's go with those we every game. We wore them one game. I know. Why don't we? They're done, and then they're gone. It's why don't like, we wear those every game? I don't, I don't know, man. It's, I mean, let's, let's embody that this old school spirit because if we try to compete on the, like, who's more modern, who's cooler, U of O is going to win every time. But if you look at OSU's campus, biased, it's whatever, a, it's prettier than U of O's. <laughs> it's old school. Let's let's embrace that. Let's go with it. But I, I still think you can change the uniforms. Yeah. To yes, I agree. I, I, think, I agree. Our uniforms you know, are Not stupid. to be like a fashion expert or anything about <laughs> college football uniforms or whatnot, but definitely I think the football program, they can change that stuff up about make it more exciting for these new recruits. OSU is a tier one school according mm -hmm. to Nike, which is on the same level of U of O, right. Oklahoma, Florida, all these big name schools. So embrace that accept the changes that nike is willing to make because they know what they are doing teams get in the news for their uniforms about three to four times a year mm -hmm. and so if we could get one of those hey that just right there brings a bunch of eyes yeah. to oregon state university and get some get some recognition for our football team even if it is solely based on the clothes that we're wearing out there it's a, i mean that's a step in the right direction right, right? That's all it is. do you guys disagree on anything we sure we're supposed to, but yeah, uh, I mean, you just gave us these questions that are just... I'm going to have to rewrite these yeah. questions. Well, <laughs> Next week, I'll uh, bring it back. I mean, I'm going to cut I don't like throat that. I don't here. like that oh. jacket, though. Let's yeah. <laughs> this jacket's got every color in it, so I can wear it with anything. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, I don't know about that, Crawford. Well, that's, uh, all right. well that's all the time we have for you tonight. ATS plug. Oh, yeah. Tune in on Friday from 2 to 4 p.m. against the Spread Sports Talk Radio with yours truly, Boone Kruger. It's going to be really good this week, so please tune in. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be hosting it, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kaz, any final thoughts? No, man. Once again, good to be here. And uh, Crawford, hopefully next time we can go a little more head-to-head. -head. Oh, yeah. I'd love to go. I'm a tyrant titan. Yeah. You know, I'm going to take you down. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Clippers <laughs> are going to lose in four. Five. Five. They're going to lose in five. They're going to lose in five. All right. Well, on behalf of Alice Crawford, Kaz Rezizzi, and, and everyone here at the Beaver Sports Show, I'm Boone Kruger. Hope you have a great night, and we'll see you back here next week.